We're going to talk about Cosmos. And Cosmos, it's, a long, it's been a long time coming. Um, Cosmos is the internet, internet of blockchains. So today, we have all of these blockchains that are siloed, isolated from each other. They're somewhat interoperable, but they don't actually communicate with each other. They're like PC computers from 1980, where you have to use a floppy disk to, you know, communicate between them. We don't have an internet yet. So that's what Cosmos is about. It's about connecting blockchains together. And uh, by doing so, we'll solve a lot of the problems that exist in the uh, cryptocurrency space today. So I want to start with how we got here. Um, so in order to get to Cosmos, the first thing we had to do was solve the proof of stake problem. Um, I started with this problem back in 2014. Um, I looked at Bitcoin and uh, realized that the proof of work is like, it's really new, it's really secure, um, but it doesn't scale, right? So it's not only is it somewhat slow, like taking an hour to confirm, but it also doesn't allow you to easily have multiple uh, parallel proof of work chains um, and, and have like real plausible security because the miners are so anonymous. They're basically mercenaries and they'll follow wherever the money is. So I was wondering, okay, not only that, it's also environmentally terribly unfriendly, right? So I was trying to figure out a solution to this and I found the answer in, in some of these papers. So it turns out that ever since mm, the 70s, actually, um, the Byzantine fault tolerance problem, uh, the consensus problem, had been in active research for a long time, even before the Bitcoin paper. Uh, so you see the here that the FLP impossibility result came out in 1985. Uh, Lynch was one of the authors. Uh, and then just a few years later, they figured out how to achieve Byzantine fault tolerant consensus in a, um, in a realistic environment uh, where the internet latency might be problematic sometimes. Um, in 1999, there was a pretty significant breakthrough in making a practical Byzantine fault, toler fault tolerant system, but this was not really, it wasn't really a project that took off. Nobody really needed it, nobody cared. So, and then 2008, Satoshi Nakamoto created Bitcoin, and um, that actually became the first widely deployed BFT system. But maybe it's time to look back and try some of these other non proof of work algorithms. Uh, so that's what Tendermint is about. Tendermint is a is an, it's an open source Byzantine fault tolerant consensus engine or a blockchain engine. Um, it's designed to work for all kinds of chains, public chains uh, and private chains. So um, uh, it's already being used uh, by uh, several companies in the consortium private blockchain space today, the enterprise blockchain space. Um, so ErisDB was one of the first products built on it but uh, there's been many proof of concepts uh, developed and being developed today on Tendermint. Uh, and we'd like, we would like Cosmos to be the first, mm, one of the first proof of stake public chains uh, that's powered by Tendermint. So if you look at the, the diagrams here, it kind of gives you a sense of where it fits in the layer. Um, it's middleware, so it sits between the hardware and everything else on top. Um, it handles peer-to-peer -peer networking, consensus, um, it handles, it creates a blockchain structure, it has RPC so you can interact with it, um, and it handles uh, transaction broadcasting. And what it does is after it comes to consensus with a bunch of nodes about what the next block is, it will push that block to the application, which is up here. So the application can be permissioned, or it could be something that is permissionless doesn't matter. Um, the interface between the application and Tendermint is called ABCI. Um, it's, uh, we call it ABCI uh, because it sounds nice, app blockchain interface. Um, so it handles things like, you know, making sure that a transaction is valid. Uh, and it's, so that's the check TX message that uh, Tendermint can deliver to the application. Um, and once a block is committed, then it will deliver the transaction saying, uh, actually run this thing now. Um, and of course, uh, it can also get a Merkle hash back from the application state and include it in the blockchain. 
So it's really a general application agnostic blockchain engine. Um, and we've been developing this, actually um, back in 2015, 2016, we were developing um, Tendermint with the EVM built in. So we were uh, originally going to launch like a competitor to, to Ethereum, uh, that was a proof of stake system. Uh, and then the whole blockchain enterprise fad came around and we, we thought, let's do this and raise VC money, but it didn't work out. Um, but the nice thing that came out of that is that uh, it forced us to uh, make it in general. And so we're very happy with where it is today. Um, Tendermint no longer has an EVM, right? It's application agnostic. Um, but uh, it's a powerful system because it's so general. Um, for example, uh, we were able to take Tendermint and mash it up with Go Ethereum. And you can see that in the Ethermint project. So what Ethermint is, is uh, it's basically what we were originally working on. It, it's the EVM uh, on Tendermint BFT consensus. The nice thing is uh, it has the same RPC endpoints as Go Ethereum. It's basically Go Ethereum with uh, Tendermint plugged in. Basecoin is another um, application, a blockchain built on Tendermint, but it doesn't have a virtual machine. Uh, it's written in Go, uh, and uh, it has a plugin system that makes it easy to develop uh, mm -hmm. any kind of blockchain system. So if you want to, for example, create a new kind of virtual machine uh, or even a non-virtual machine blockchain application, um, you might want to consider building on Basecoin. It handles a lot of the common complexities like uh, uh, accounts, and uh, it's also a multi-asset system. We're actually going to build on Basecoin as a framework to build all of the, or most of the blockchains in the Cosmos system. So the properties of Tendermint are pretty good. Um, for example, you can have 100 validators. So these are like equivalent to Bitcoin miners, except there's no proof of work component here. Um, and uh, we've had test nets where we deployed them on a global scale uh, in eight global data centers, and we were able to get three-second block finality. So every three, every three seconds, a block is being committed, and you don't have to wait because it's a different kind of system. You don't have to wait for confirmations. Um, it's also high throughput, so we've designed it to be fast. Um, there's like BitTorrent-like stuff going on there where the block, you know, to broadcast a block. Uh, so generally, the application itself is going to be the bottleneck because, uh, you know, once you get to like hundreds or even a thousand transactions per second, you're l usually limited by the Merkle tree or just internal storage system of the application. And that will probably be the case in uh, Ethereum. As far as I know, I haven't measured anything there. Um, it's fault tolerant, so it can handle up to uh, a third of malicious actors. This is in a... In a, a uh, partially synchronous system at the kind of speed that we want. This is the best you can do. Um, so it's optimal. Uh, it's also fork accountable. So all that means is that when a double spend attack happens and the blockchain w were to fork, then you can, there's a way to figure out who is innocent and like who is responsible for this attack. And, and if you consider the, these two properties together, it means that when there is a double spend attack, the cost to the attacker is significant. So mm, it gives you concrete security guarantees. It's open source. Uh, we fought very hard to make it Apache 2.0. There was an issue sometime last year. Anyways. Oh, and uh, it's, it's general purpose, like I mentioned before. So um, a lot of people say that, you know, ask us, isn't Tenement too centralized, like for a public blockchain? And that's a great question. Um, I believe that it's not. So even with 100 validators, um, w I believe that it can be a sufficiently distributed decentralized system for a public chain. Um, so here's why. Like, if you look at Bitcoin, the top 20 mining pools in Bitcoin constitute like 95% of the mining power. So there's basically only 20 actors in there uh, on a short-term basis, short time scale basis that is, make, that is making any decision. And yet, you know, it's decentralized. And I've seen miners pull away from, you know, uh, mining pools that are too big because they don't want to centralize mining power to a single pool operator. 
And this, so I think there are um, sensible economic like game theory at play here. Uh, so I believe that if we support, say, 100 um, validator spots and allow for delegation of your validation power, your voting power, to any of those 100 slots, people will figure out a way to distribute the power rate, you know, sufficiently. Uh, not only that, today we can support 100 validators, but uh, in the future, as our internet speed becomes hopefully exponentially faster and our parallel com computation power becomes faster exponentially, if that were to happen, then we would also be able to support an exponentially growing number of validators as well. So in 20 to 30 years, we might be able to handle 10,000 or even more uh, validators with the same block time. And that would be amazing. But I don't even know if that's necessary. So what can you do with this? Um, one of the things you can do with uh, BFT proof of stake system is have blockchains communicate to each other. The reason why is because um, the like client SPV is very short and nice. Mm, so like client SPV, what do I mean? It's, it's like proof of, ex uh, proof of existence. It's, it's like what your phone is going to do if it wants to know what the state of the blockchain is. Um, so what, to do that, what you need to do is first prove uh, the most recent block hash, say. So it's the block hash and uh, two-thirds of uh, signatures or more. And you need to prove uh, in something about that block hash uh, with a Merkle proof. So it could be anything from the block header to a transaction in that block. It can even be uh, uh, the application state. So if you look at the Ethereum purchase tree, you, know, you can construct a Merkle proof all the way up to the block. So these two things together, the block commit and the, the thing, the app, say the app, uh, the key value pair that you want to prove, uh, those two things, uh, it's a short data structure that you can commit onto another blockchain as a transaction. So as long as that other blockchain uh, is programmed to understand uh, how to deal with this data packet, how to interpret it, you're able to have two blockchains that can communicate with each other. Um, so there's many ways you can have IBC. So like IBC is just a concept, inter-blockchain communication, like object-oriented programming. It's not a protocol, it's just a concept. Um, what we're going to use IBC for is for uh, transferring tokens from one blockchain to another. But you can do other things, like uh, call a contract. Uh, and it can be with or without acknowledgement. So we can create a protocol, a specification for uh, UDP and TCP, like IBC. Um, but it doesn't have to be about packets. It doesn't have to be about data packets. Right? It can also be about state. So, for example, you can prove to another blockchain that your account balance is something. Or you can uh, allow access control based on you know, the state of your account uh, on another blockchain. You can do name resolution. You can do a lot of stuff. Uh, the data packet is just a kind of state packet just because you're including that data packet in the state, in the state Merkle tree. Anyways, details. So what can you do with this? Um, the Cosmos Hub is essentially a sidechain system. Uh, it's the first blockchain that we're going to launch in the Cosmos network. It's a multi-asset system by design. Um, and uh, it's basically like the Bitcoin sidechain idea, except at the center, instead of Bitcoin, you have a multi-asset proof of stake system. Uh, this allows you to scale, like the EVM, because you can have multiple zones. And it also allows you to have interoperability uh, between multiple kinds of logic. And the thing I'm most excited about is the distributed exchange. Uh, some details. Um, the Cosmos DEX, so this is the distributed exchange. It's a blockchain that connects to the hub, which is also another blockchain. And because the hub is multi-asset, and the DEX accepts any token from the hub, uh, you can have a distributed custody exchange. Now, why, okay, so if you go to this site, you can see more details about this DEX. It's pretty cool. Um, you know, and so people might ask, well, what's the point of the DEX? You know, why do you want a new design? Why not just use atomic cross-chain transactions? And the answer is because you can't set limit orders on an atomic cross-chain transaction system because both parties to a trade need to be online which means you're not going to be able to gain enough market depth, which means nobody wants to use that system. People are going to continue to use centralized exchanges because that's where the, the depth is. But with this, we can do much better than that. We can have the best of both worlds. 
So what's a blockchain? It's a sovereign system. Uh, it's a community. It needs to govern itself. So if you look at what happened, with, uh, I don't have much time, so I'm going to run through these. But uh, the way we think of this, you know, a blockchain, we think of the blockchain validators as a service providers for customers. Validators are offering a service and they're earning something. If you look at what happened with the DAO, you know, there was an issue where uh, it was a failure of governance. Right? There was an issue and there's always going to be issues. But what happened afterwards? Uh, we didn't know how to deal with it because the miners voted. But who cares? Because miners are anonymous and they're mercenaries. They'll follow the money. The ETH holders weren't supposed to vote for anything at all. They're just supposed to be holding tokens for using it, right? They never had any social contract to vote. So what we need is an explicit governance system that has specific rules about who needs to vote and how, and how to make decisions. So the Cosmos Hub is also going to have a governance system in it. It's going to start with a constitution about how to make decisions and what it means when a resolution is passed. Uh, there's going to be an on-chain solution that can update parameters according to, you know, if a proposal is passed that wants to change a parameter, it will be changed. And of course, we will also have tools for offline governance in case the chain fails. You're going to have to use social uh, means to come to a reorganization or a hard fork. Sometimes you have to do that. Um, more details. So the fundraiser is coming soon. Uh, we've been preparing this for a long time with uh, Tendermint. Uh, and we have BaseCoin, the framework, being built now. And uh, we're very close to a, a demo of the hub, but uh, you know, it's coming soon. So check out cosmos.network for more information. And uh, thank you.